I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker. Vivek Shreya is a multidisciplinary artist who tackles topics such as community, diversity, identity, leadership, and failure in her talks, her music, and her artwork. Her work, How to Fail as a Pop Star, has become a book, a play, and is currently being adapted into a television pilot script with the support of the CBC. Her best-selling book, I'm Afraid of Men, was heralded by Vanity Fair as cultural rocket fuel. She's a 2021 Pantene ambassador for their campaign on the power of self-expression and represented in Indigo's 2021 Reading Challenge. She was also chosen by MAC Cosmetics to represent their Originals campaign, celebrating nine Canadians who embrace their values of inclusivity, artistry, and a love of high-performing makeup. Her South Asian heritage and her aims to educate and inspire audiences about mental health, queerness and inclusion was featured by Vogue India as one of five fearless Indian LGBTQ Instagram personalities. A Polaris Music Prize nominee, she's one half of the music duo Too Attached and she's a board director with the Tegan and Sarah Foundation. She's also an assistant professor of creative writing at the University of Calgary and author of more than 10 books who's also earned honors from the Writers Trust of Canada. Today, we're happy to welcome Vivek Shreya on the topic of, you have more power than you think. Welcome Vivek. Hello, thank you so much for that really generous um, welcome. I really, really appreciate that. Um, thank you so much to everyone that's just joining. I'm just sharing my presentation here. Um, here we go. Okay. So like I said, my name is Vivek Shreya and I am an artist. Um, I won't bore you with more information because Teresa already <laughs> made me sound uh, amazing. So I'm gonna, I wanna take you back and share a story with you um, and a story based on my experiences uh, in junior high. Junior high has marked the sudden death of sweatpants. They've been replaced by name brand denim and name calling, which will continue every day for the next six years. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed Will Jensen walks close behind me on my way to class. He's on his tippy toes as though he's wearing high heels, fluttering his hands and talking with a lisp to his audience of jocks. Is that what I look like? Do you have to be such a sissy? They laugh and I pretend I'm oblivious. They have to laugh because Will is the most popular boy in school. Maybe if I laugh too, Will and I could be friends. He kicks me and I say, sorry. He's puzzled. He kicks me again, this time timidly, like a child unsure of his own strength. And I apologize again. His friends find this funny. So he keeps kicking, they keep laughing, and I keep apologizing. I'm bound to sorry as though it's my only defense, as though each sorry holds a tiny spark of dignity. The same jocks surround me by my locker later and warn me of impending dangers. Are you sure no one's beaten you up yet? You're definitely going to get beaten up in high school. Definitely. One of the brown jocks, the one who laughs the loudest, follows me into the washroom. He stands wide at the stall right next to me, making his presence known. I pee as fast as I can, focusing my eyes straight down, thinking about how our matching skin doesn't protect me and how that feels like a betrayal. I look for safety with the girls. We have more in common, like our love for Jodeci and General Hospital. I'm safe for them too. I'm the boy they can talk to about their crushes on the other boys. Maybe I am too safe. Mia Zinner, one of my few friends, likes to tell me how much she wishes I was dead. It's only 9.30 a.m., but I just wanna kill you, Gaylord. When I ask my parents if I can change schools, my dad tells me that my hairstyle is the real problem. You know, in India, boys who part their hair like yours in the middle are, you know. So I learn which hallways to avoid sissy and which faces to avoid. If you ever look at me again, I will pound the shit out of you fucking fag. How to walk a little firmer, talk a little deeper, be a little smaller, but I can't make it stop. I catch an episode of the Wonder Years when Kevin is getting picked on by a bully. Loser, loser, loser. Fed up one day, Kevin responds, fine, I am a loser. The bully responds, you are? He never picks on Kevin again. I immediately take note and am determined to test this out the next day. Gaylord, 
fine, I am a gay lord. You are? Bingo, just as predicted. Yes, yes I am. Do you even know what that means? Um, sure I do, it means loser. No, it means you like boys. So hi again, everyone. Um, like I said, this story um, is my, um, it's based on my experience. I'm just trying to move my slide here. It's based on my experience in junior high and high school, um, the kind of experience that I had growing up in Edmonton, Alberta. And uh, it's one of the stories that I included in my first book, God Loves Hair. So this is young me <laughs> holding a plastic little flower um, just so you can get context because I think sometimes when we think about junior high, we actually forget just how young we were. And so, you know, this is who I was at the time. Gay straight alliances, you know, didn't exist. You know, GSAs and even language like homophobia wasn't really circulating um, at the time. So, you know, my experiences of getting bullied in high school and junior high it really showed me that survival was about withdrawing and about being invisible. So in a lot of ways, if you can imagine, <laughs> being a leader or becoming a, a leader was very unlikely for me. And yet, as I grew into an adult, my experiences, the experiences, these negative experiences that I had, had another effect on me. I found myself compelled to make art to make the kinds of art and resources that might have made my life as that young boy more manageable when I was that age. So I'm gonna be sharing with you two examples today of um, art that I have created uh, as a way to give back to my communities or think of my communities um, with the hope that it inspires you to reflect on the ways that you too might be able to create change in the communities that you are part of or that you want to be an ally to. So the first example I wanted to give you is that eight years ago, um, eight years after I moved to Toronto, so I, I grew up in Edmonton, like I mentioned, I was working at a college in downtown Toronto um, and I coordinated what was called the Positive Space Program. Um, and so Positive Space, most colleges and universities have a Positive Space Program and it's, it's, it's essentially they're set up to try and make the space, the college or the university, more inclusive for LGBTQ students. And so because I was doing that work, queer youth, queer students would come see me in the office and I was astounded. So this is 2012. So, you know, I guess uh, almost 10 years ago, but still like in the 2000s. And I was shocked how often queer youth would say to me, is there something wrong with me? I feel like I have a disease. My friends and family will never accept me. And, you know, at the time I had imagined because of shows like Orange is the New Black and, you know, we have Pose now and Modern Family, you know, I just, I had, I had sort of believed that it hashtag it, it got better for the younger generation. I also had imagined that living in Toronto made being queer easier for younger people. But what I was hearing in 2012 from young queers was not so differently from the experience of what I felt when I was a young queer in the 90s in Edmonton. And so I wanted to make a project. I wanted to make a project that would show a different perspective of queerness. I wanted to give something to these young queer kids who were coming to my office. I wanted to be able to show them something that would show, not dismiss the struggle of queerness, but show them the richness of what it meant to be queer. And so one of the, the things that kept haunting me is this question, what do you love about being queer? And so what I did was I filmed 34 people, all these lovely people answering one question. And uh, what do you love about being queer? For some context, I was very much an independent artist at the time. So this wasn't a big budget film. This was something that I was just moved to want to do to make something to give to my communities. And so I actually filmed it in my kitchen <laughs> on, a, on a camera uh, that I splurged on with my visa and learned Final Cut from the internet, from YouTube. Um, and I put together a film and it was like my third short film most of these people I didn't even really know. Uh, some of them I just cold emailed on Facebook um, because I had a lot of admiration for them. And the project ended up growing 
after I made the film, I was like, I'd love for people beyond my social circles to be able to um, find out about it. And so I created a Tumblr site um, where anyone in the world who was identified as queer could then submit their answer of what they loved about being queer and could also um, submit a photo. And then both of those would be uploaded and would be hosted on the What I Love About Being Queer Tumblr site. And what has made me so excited about the Tumblr site is now anytime a queer youth is struggling with who they are, and maybe you're wondering what is there to love about being queer, this now exists as a, as a free resource for them. The other thing that I did was that the film, I was very fortunate that it got picked up by some LGBTQ film festivals. And so I asked all the partners if I could set up a workstation outside of the theater where I had index cards and a Polaroid camera and anyone who identified as queer who saw the film could then participate in the project by getting their photo taken like Jenny over here and write what they love about being queer. And that would also get scanned and would get hosted on the What I Love About Being Queer Tumblr website. And so by the end of the year, I had like 200 new answers between the Tumblr site and the book uh, and the and the index cards. And so one of my friends suggested, why don't you turn this into a coffee table book? And I was like, how do I do that? I don't, I don't really know um, how I would make that happen. You know, I'd self-published my first book, which I read a story from, uh, but you know, self-publishing can be really expensive. And so I started thinking, you know, maybe I could get a publisher to get behind this. And I approached a bunch of publishers and they turned me down because they said, art books don't sell. Um, you know, one publisher was interested, but like, I really wanted it to be a specific size. I wanted it to be ostentatious and bright and 12 by 12, like a vinyl. And they were like, you know, uh, we don't make books this size. And so I thought, okay, I want to do this, but I don't know how to do this. Who has money? <laughs> and so I thought about my workplace, George Brown College, where I worked, where a number of the people um, were like in the film were actually faculty members there. And again, I was inspired by conversations with queer youth I met there. And I don't know how many of you work in post-secondary institutions, but so often we have like orientation where we give out swag and we spent like thousands of dollars on like stress balls. So I did a presentation for my manager at the time and this, we'd never done anything like this. This was completely out of the box. I said to her, listen, we, every year we spend this much amount of money on stress balls. What if we created a book? What if we created a coffee table book that has like lovely answers about what they love about being, what people love about being queer. Uh, we include faculty members, we include students. And let's say all the proceeds from the book go to a scholarship for LGBTQ students at the college. And so I did a 10 minute presentation. And after the presentation, I said, any questions? And she said, no, let's do it. And so um, the What I Love About Being Queer book was, was created, which for me was really exciting because again, part of what excited me about creating a book on top of the film and the Tumblr was the idea of going to the Edmonton Public Library and seeing a bright yellow book that said, What I Love About Being Queer. And um, it was really exciting putting out the book. We sold out in a year. It reached the Philippines, as you can see over here. It was nominated for a Lambda Literary Award, one of the most prestigious LGBTQ awards in the world. And we raised $15,000 for the LGBTQ scholarship for students at George Brown College. So that's just one example of how I saw a need in my community. I created a project on my own. And then to build on that project, I thought outside of the box to get funding for it to grow into a bigger project, which then actually created revenue to support the very community who had inspired the project. The second example I wanna share with you is a mentorship program I set up independently on my website in 2016. So I set this up because I really got tired of call out culture. Um, I think call out can be really important when we're, we're naming truth to power, when we're calling out Pete, like our governments. <laughs> but I see a lot of call out happening within communities. Um, and I would see this in Toronto a lot where, you know, a young artist would present their work and then an older artist would criticize them or publicly, you know, uh, critique them. And I felt like what was happening was that people do not know how to talk to each other anymore. And I was like, well, I can't get rid of call out culture, but how do I find ways for artists to talk to each other more so that we're not just like calling each other out? How do I create a system of support? And so I decided to create a mentorship program again, independently on my website. I had no idea if anyone would 
participate. I did an open call. I said, you know, any artist in any discipline in the age range under 25 who's BIPOC. And I got, uh, and I, I ended up getting like nine to 12 applications. And after I got nine to 12 applications, I was like, but I want to work with all of these youth. So what I did was, how do I work with all of them? And also think about my own workload. And so my workaround was, how about I work with every one of them for one month of the year, as opposed to working with one artist for the full year, I'll work with one artist for a month and that way I get to work with all of them. So I went back to all of them and I said, listen, I got this many submissions. I wanna work with all of you, excuse me, instead of choosing one of you. Um, so how would you feel about a modified mentorship for a year? And every one of them said yes. And it was a really incredible experience. So again, an example of how I saw a need and just created something that, that there was a huge response to. And I got to work with these wonderful artists from like Malaysia and the States and, and in Canada as well. And at the end of the mentorship program after a year, I thought, I want to do this again. But like, you know, again, I think sometimes older people have a tendency to project mentorship on the youth. We're like, we need, the youth need mentorship. And I wanted to make sure I wasn't making that mistake of projecting a narrative. And so I, I started evaluating what was the strength of the mentorship program and what were these young artists telling me repeatedly. And a lot of them were writers, even though they were in different mediums. And the thing that came up over and over again was how do I get published? So I was thinking, you know what would be great is to work with a young artist, work on their book for a year, and then at the end, they would somehow publish their book. So that way they would have something tangible to build and launch their career off of. And so once again, I started thinking, well, could I self-publish their work? Like, what would I, like, how do I make this happen? And so I started thinking about, well, what if I did a partnership with a publishing company? Um, and so I thought of my first publisher, um, Arsenal Pulp Press, who published my first books. And I approached them, they're a small press in Vancouver. And I said, I have this out of the box idea. I really wanna support young BIPOC emerging artists, but it's not enough to just give them mentorship. I wanna give them something tangible that they can go out in the world and then build their career off of. And so I waited for six months. And after six months, my publisher came back and said, yes. And VS Books, which is a new imprint or was a new imprint at the time in 2017 um, was created. And I ended up getting to publish Shut Up Your Pretty by Taya Matanji, a Scarborough based author, um, I think two years ago. And her book has now gone to like, been, you know, she's been on the cover of Quill and Choir. She's won like a giant Ontario literary prize. And then last year I signed Cicely Bell Blaine um, who is one of the founders of Black Lives Matter. And uh, I, I published their first book of poetry. So the topic of today, the theme of today's um, talk that I wanted to sort of hit home is this idea that you have more power than you think. And this includes me. And I think this has been like a, sort of a radical idea for me to wrap my mind around. You know, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, being a brown queer femme teenager who was subjected to relentless homophobia and misogyny I would have never ever imagined being a leader. And I don't think anyone else would have thought <laughs> I would become a leader because like I said, what my experiences taught me was to disappear. But also I was able to grow from my experiences and in growing from my experiences, I've had to also recognize the ways that even though I am, I do experience racism, I do experience homophobia, I have amassed other privileges along the way, whether that's class privilege from having a job, um, or having able-bodied privilege. And so thinking about the privileges I have has been really useful. And I wanna come back to that point um, shortly. The other thing that's been really helpful in me reimagining myself as a leader has been constantly remembering my mom. You know, I think we have this idea that a leader is someone who's at the front, who has the microphone, who's doing the things that I'm doing right now, but there's so many ways to be a leader in the world and my mom, for me, is sort of like the reminder that like sometimes being a leader means doing the hard work. She was someone who at my religious organization was constantly behind the scenes, was cooking the meals, was scrubbing the floors. She was never recognized for the work that she did. But I think of her as a leader because the organization wouldn't have been able to function without her. So for those of you that are like, but I'm not an author and I don't have a website, like what's this person saying to me? I think, you know, the message that I'm trying to impart on you 
is that there are many ways to be a leader and being a leader doesn't mean just necessarily being at the front. So, you know, coming back to this idea of you have more power than you think, like I said, for me, recognizing the privileges I have elsewhere has really helped me to think about, okay, if I have privileges in all these other places, how do I use my privilege to give back? And I think, you know, the only way for real change to occur and to push the needle forward is for people with power to use their power responsibly or to even give up the power. And I think, unfortunately, most people with power, and we all have power, are extremely, rec um, really extremely hesitant to recognizing the power they have more and let alone giving up the power. So if I can leave you with one thing today, you know, aside from the, the quick examples that I shared with you is, and I know this sounds a little bit corny, but I, I swear I do this, is that when I wake up in the morning, at least once a week, I think about how am I redirecting my power and privilege to support those who don't have as much as me? So again, I'm going to say it one more time for you. How am I redirecting my power and privilege to support those who don't have as much as me? And again, when you do that, it doesn't mean you have to be at the front. It means sometimes taking you know, wild choices by asking your manager to fund a book or approaching somebody else to give you an imprint. But you know, I think it's the combination of thinking about your power, thinking about how you give back and sort of like out of the box thinking to build your leadership capacity because leaders aren't built alone um, that I think can empower you to be a leader in your community. So I'm gonna end there and um, I'm gonna stop my presentation here and then happy to take questions. Thank you, Vivek, for uh, that really uh, personal and vulnerable sharing of your experiences and stories and some of the resulting strategies and, and how you give back as a result. Um, it's a, a very personal way to share your experience. Thank you. Um, we do have some questions that have come in. Great. And um, yeah, so you had talked about um, your mentorship program and uh, Sean had a question about um, any advice if you wanted to start a mentorship program within a large organization. Um, are there specific steps you would recommend? So one of the things I didn't talk about, and like I said, I really, uh, one of the things I, I really want to hit home is that like, you know, it, it takes the work of being a leader it requires a lot of help. Like no one's just a leader on their own. And I think with anything I've done, I've always consulted with other groups first. So if you're interested in building a mentorship program for me, like I ran it by close people in my life. I ran it by other like BIPOC community members. So, I mean, I think, uh, you know, run it by other people in the organization, look at other models of mentorship that exist. I think we're at an exciting time where more and more mentorship programs are being offered. The reason why I shared mine wasn't also just to show you that you can just be an independent person and create a mentorship, but also to show you that there are many ways to think of mentorship. I think sometimes when people think of mentorship, it's like, I'm going to be doing this for like a year or two years. But what I was able to do is actually offer these sort of like short bursts of mentorship uh, per month. So I think consulting and doing your research. And then the big thing is trying, right? I think the reason why I show you two examples is that I did it the first time and then I reevaluated what was working, what wasn't working. And then I went a kind of different direction and focused mostly on books and the imprint. So don't, I think being a leader requires just taking the leap as opposed to hoping that it's perfect, if that makes sense. Yes, and as you say, kind of that iteration as time goes on and you have more experience. Um, we have a question from Donna, um, wondering about uh, how COVID has affected your programs. Um, has it provided more outreach? Are they more popular or have you changed anything? Um, so for instance, my imprint, we changed the model of the imprint. So again, to, to, to talk about how every year I reevaluate, I, one of the things I did differently with the imprint for the third round is I've rethought this idea of emerging. I think in our culture, we often conflate emerging with youth. And the reality is there's so many older people, 50 plus, you know, artists who never had the kinds of opportunities that the younger generation has. So the new open call that we did last year, we said 50 plus BIPOC artists. So that's one way that we changed it, but then COVID hit. And so one of the things I've had to do is just keep in mind that the open call that we're doing, which is essentially for elders, these are the people that have been most impacted by uh, the coronavirus. And so we've extended the, the deadline multiple times. 
um, just to in to in recognition that like you know now hasn't been for some people it's a productive time but for a lot of people it's not so that's one way in which um, you know, my mentorship program has changed is sort of like thinking through that. And then Cicely Bell's book came out in the fall and that was a huge pivot as well, was just sort of like rethinking. I mean, the goal would have been us for us to tour together and, you know, me to be able to like uh, promote their book live, but we, we had to sort of reimagine what it was like to put, put out a book in, in the pandemic. I appreciate your use of that word, reimagining. <laughs> <laughs> Any of us are doing. Yes. Uh, there was also a question about um, mental health and uh, if you have any experience from what you've seen in your communities about um, things that are helping or uh, how people can kind of have a greater sense of wellness at this time. I mean, I think the number one thing is like, don't come to things like this and feel like you have to do a lot of things, <laughs> you know, like I, my, I want to inspire you, but I also think there's a time and place. And right now I think that, you know, there's so much guilt and people feel so burdened uh, by what they're not doing, by what they're not accomplishing. I think we, our brain, even though we know this isn't an artist residency, our brain is like, I've had the whole year off. And it's like, no, we actually have not had the year off. You know, and some of us have literally been like frontline workers, but on top of that, for those of us who've been working from home, like it's not a year off, it's not a time necessarily to be doing things. So I think whatever you can do to give yourself grace and to really constantly remind yourself, this isn't business as usual, we are in a global pandemic, uh, my job, no matter how many times I go on social media and I see all the things other people are doing, just know that they're probably crying themselves to sleep, just like all of us. So yeah, just be kind to yourself. I think that's a lovely note to end things on, having grace and being kind to yourself. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me.